Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And, uh, you know, as was said, Credit Point was here in September 2010, which I think that was the second field day, uh, tech field day. And Gary Oliverio, one of the Credit Point founders, uh, presented here. And I think, uh, you know, as, as we talked about, Credit Point pioneered the, uh, the concept of the, the battery operated mobile hotspot. And we did that with this small battery operated device. And what you would do is you would take, um, these USB modem sticks and just plug it into the device and then you have, uh, you know, two hours of battery life. That was when batteries were really, really good. Um, the name Cradle Point came from the concept of taking a, uh, a phone. This is not a smartphone, but one of the first data enabled phones and dropping it into a cradle that would radiate Wi-Fi. That was the idea. We brought that idea to Sprint and they said, great idea, interesting idea, but what we want is for you to do something that works with these USB modem sticks. They said, we had 200,000 of them and we'd like to start moving them. And so we, um, we moved over, developed the battery operated hotspot. And these were on the shelves of Best Buy, Fry's Electronics, et cetera. We, uh, about six years ago, had a management offsite and said, who do we want to be? And uh, the answer is we realized we did not want to be on the shelves of Best Buy. We did not want to be a consumer company with the margins and competition associated with uh, consumer technology. So I'm here on behalf of Cradle Point to introduce you to the new Cradle Point and uh, talk to you about where we've come since, uh, since 2010, the last time we presented. So in terms of company, we were founded in 04 and we're up to 400 employees. When I first met Cradle Point, they were down the hall from where I worked with my father. There were three of them. <laughs> And uh, it's just amazing seeing the growth uh, that's happened. The company is, um, is VC backed. Uh, we just raised, I think this is in the press, we just raised uh, just shy of 50 million at the beginning of the year. And we're, um, we're really the industry's premier solution provider of 4G LTE solutions for distributed enterprises. And if you do reference checks on some of our customers, and I'll show you who some of those customers are, <coughs> Uh, we have the industry reputation for having a variety of LTE solutions. Uh, this is the tip of the iceberg. I'll, I'll sh show you some of the platforms later. But our reputation is it just works. And it turns out that uh, for whatever reason, very few companies can reliably keep a VPN tunnel alive over 4G LTE. Uh, it's surprising to me how hard it's been. I, I assume that by now there would be 20 other companies that have just baked it into their network equipment, their routers. And the reality is it's a lot harder than it looks. And we'll go into some details of why that is. But in terms of our platform, I'm going to talk about the different platforms we have, the hardware platforms. We have a variety of platforms that are purpose built for specific applications like fixed locations, M to M applications, transportation, uh, etc. Our customers are distributed enterprises, and these are enterprises that have tens or hundreds or thousands of locations that uh, are really in the business, they're customer facing, so PCI compliance is very important to them. Uh, network segmentation, both physical and logical, is very important, especially given PCI compliance. Um, and and the, so our distributed enterprise, they come in three categories. There are the fixed locations, and these are retail stores <coughs> or branch offices. There are the nomadic locations, and this might be a Redbox kiosk or a rug doctor or some sort of M to M application uh, where it's all wireless, but it doesn't move that much. And then the mobile applications, and we'll go through examples of uh, buses, police cars, etc. But really, the, the key thing about Cradle Point is we've, we've been on a tear. We've been growing for the last three years at 60% per year. Uh, we have over 1.2 million deployments, and that's a long ways from these days. Um, and these are good deployments ac across a lot of enterprise customers. And uh, we've been adopted uh, by some of the biggest and best companies that are out there. So I wanted to quickly introduce the team that's going to support me. If I can ask you guys to come up. And uh, I'll just introduce them by name, and we're going to uh, kind of mix it in. But Michael Dickens, who's been with me at Cradle Point for six years, is a senior solutions engineer. He's, uh, he's kind of feet on the street for talking to customers. 
Kent Woodruff, uh, some of you may recognize his name. He's our chief security officer, and uh, uh, he's a pleasure to have. Uh, I, I watch him like a hawk when I let him use my laptop. <laughs> and uh, David Rush is a senior product manager. Uh, David's been with me for five years at the company. And uh, basically, if you look at all of the hardware, a lot of the firmware, uh, if you can touch it, he owns it. Um, he's, our, he's our token MIT. Uh, guru as well. So. <laughs> and you'll be seeing more of these folks a little bit later. So uh, moving on, the, the trend that we're seeing, and I know this is wireless tech field day, and I know uh, a lot of the discussion has been on the LAN side. Uh, we're going to still talk about the wireless on the, on the LAN side because that's an important part of our, uh, our, our solution. But I also want to introduce the concept of the wireless on the, on the WAN side. And frankly, it's not just 4G LTE. Uh, there's other things coming down the pipe. Uh, carriers like Comcast and Cablevision are rolling out Metro Wi-Fi. Uh, we're in a really, really good position with that because we really embrace Wi-Fi as a WAN source as well. Uh, but what we're seeing in this world is for enterprise customers, um, a lot of them are very dependent on cloud-based applications. And when you put your application in the cloud, one of the biggest problems is if the network goes down, you have no access to that, that cloud-based application. We saw that in Hurricane Katrina with a large insurance company. And uh, uh, a after their post-mortem, they deployed 18,000 of our bridges that convert 3G and 4G LTE to Ethernet. And they plugged them in the back of their perfectly good Cisco routers. It was an overlay solution. That's one of the ones that we're going to talk about up there. The second trend which you guys are very familiar with, is the concept of mobility. And it's really embracing the, uh, the customers that are bringing in smartphones and tablets into the enterprises. It's embracing employees who are increasingly using tablets and smartphones as part of their duties at the store. It might be to help the customer buy something that isn't on the shelf, but it's in a warehouse, etc. cetera. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about IoT, Internet of Things. That's uh, something that is near and dear to our hearts. And uh, from a security standpoint, uh, you can't do this without very, very good layers of security. And uh, Kent's going to help us go through uh, some examples of that. But underlying all of that is 4G LTE. And one of the biggest, uh, or I guess I could say about 4G LTE is why is today the day where it's really starting to, uh, to take off? And I'm a wireless guy. I got my ham radio license when I was 13. <laughs> Very unusual. I'm a double E. I switched to the dark side uh, after working for Hewlett Packard down here in the Bay Area as an engineering manager. I went to product management and business development. Uh, but I've been tracking this wireless stuff, and I've been in the wireless industry for a while, and uh, been tracking this up from, you know, on the GSM side, from GPRS to Edge to UMTS to HSDPA to HS, you know, essentially up to HSPA plus and on to LTE. And then on the CDMA side, it's been uh, kind of a similar but slower growth path, starting with 1XRTT, EVDO, EVDO Rev-A, et cetera. But really, the GSM side and the CDMA side have really started to converge, especially now that WiMAX is out of the question, uh, out of the equation, I should say. Uh, I can't get that out of my mind. That was a dark <laughs> period for Cradle <laughs> <laughs> Almost took us down. But... Uh, we reemerged with LTE, and there are two things that um, that I can say about LTE. One is that it's pervasive, and it's very. It's been broadly adopted in the U.S. Um, Sweden probably got the earliest start. But what happened is the difference between CDMA and GSM, the technologies, the GSM technology. So AT&T and T-Mobile had these very very fast networks, and the CDMA guys like Sprint and T-Mobile excuse me, Sprint and Verizon had the slow, you know, EVDO Rev A, which is way down here. And what happened is Verizon was so far behind that they knew that WiMAX wasn't the answer, that they needed a way to leapfrog, catch up and leapfrog. And that's why Verizon went fast and heavy with LTE in the U.S. And as a result of that, it really forced the other carriers' hands uh, to move quickly as well. And so that's why in the U.S. it's been this very, very competitive um, environment, and a lot of it is driven because CDMA speeds were so slow at EVDO Rev A. But what we're seeing right now is, and you'll be happy to hear 
that LT is not going to continue the acronym battle that they did, the, you know, on the GSM and CDMA side. So rather than use like GPRS, Edge, HSPA Plus, they're using words like Cat Three, Cat Four, Cat Six, Cat Nine, and Cat Twelve. And what we're seeing right now, and I put for reference some of the wired speeds on that side, uh, starting with dial-up, but T1 and and your typical cable your typical DSL, and we all know that fiber's coming to the curve and there's other alternatives, but, but for the average speeds, there's an inflection point that's happening right now where the, and these are theoretical speeds, these are, these are downlink, I don't have the uplink shown, but it's getting to the point where um, the performance and reliability of LTE is, uh, is getting very, very interesting to enterprises. Um, and what we're going to see is that there are four strategies for how enterprises can use LTE. I can tell you right now, we're not trying to walk into an enterprise and replace their core network. You know, the core infrastructure that they already have in going to branches and stuff. It's, it's a very fragile network, but it works. They don't want to change it. Uh, they don't want to add things to it. But the strategies around 4G are using 4G to complement that existing network. One way to complement it is by adding 4G as a failover connection. So now you have redundancy um, that's not buried in the same trench. Um, second is to augment it. Uh, a lot of the branches, retail stores are really struggling to keep up with bandwidth, the bandwidth required by new applications that are, uh, that are at the retail stores. And so another strategy is to use LTE is a way to augment the bandwidth in a secure way so you can offload some of that, the bandwidth hogs onto 4G LTE. And also we're going to talk about something that we call parallel networks, which is something that we've coined. But it's the notion of using separate 4G LTE networks as a way to securely run a specific application and not have it be on your secure network. After the target breach, um, it, this parallel networking really took off for us. People realized one of the easiest uh, ways to secure the network, and we're talking digital signage or customer Wi-Fi, is take it off my corporate network. Security through separation, through physical separation. Um, fat fingering, config files to do logical partitioning is, is a real problem these days, and the hackers can scan and find that. So that's another strategy. And a third one is to extend uh, the corporate network or extend the distributed enterprise network to um, vehicles, to temporary locations, uh, to locations where wires aren't available, and, and then also use it to just enable uh, new applications that weren't quite possible with the wired side. And then finally, we are starting to see some enterprises just say, I'm done with wires. I'm ready to replace it. And we'll talk about some use cases around that. But the economics, if you look at kind of the two primary <laughs> benefits that you get from LTE. And I'll, I'll use this as a starting point, uh, a, an easy starting point. Typical corporate enterprise with MPLS private network, wired. In San Francisco, the, to get 10 megabits per second, they're probably paying between $800 and $1,200 a month, uh, some places more. And it's not that reliable. It's 99%. It's wired. Wired has availability and reliability problems. I'm, I'm a high availability guy from Seattle. Um, so, you know, I play in the world of, I actually know uh, what's not five nines and what's not four nines, et cetera. But the options that Enterprise has is you can augment that MPLS network with 4G, keep your MPLS network, but use the carriers have their own private network, so they can tie it into your MPLS network. So now you can just simply add a data plan, add that as a failover, and increase your uptime from two nines, uh, and the math shows you can bring that almost to four nines. That's one strategy. Second strategy is replace your, your copper, your T1 copper, uh, with broadband internet, cable, and then back that up with 4G. So now you're at a, maybe $100 a month, which is a, a reduction in cost of almost 10 times, and you're still right at that four nines of availability, again, doing the math. Uh, the third option is go straight to a wireless-only solution. And uh, again, this is all dependent on how much data you're doing. This is not for video surveillance, but typical corporate enterprise at a branch typically uses two or three gigabytes per month, but consider replacing it. 
and uh, you still get three nines of availability. Uh, the carriers will tell you it's actually more than that. The carriers argue that the towers are providing more than four nines, but conservatively, let's just call it three nines at a fraction of the cost. So who's doing this? The enterprise adoption of 4G LTE is significant. Penetration is still very low, but these are the companies that have at least one or more LTE network in their enterprise, either for failover, either for parallel networking, for mobile. And we found in retail, the cost of downtime was so big that they, it was an easy sell, especially with our failover solution, where we could drop it on top. Again, we're moving well past these consumer devices. We have purpose-built enterprise devices that, uh, that can really, really drive home. There's a few logos on here I didn't put on here because we've been asked not to, but uh, you know, one of my favorite coffee shops, a very large coffee shop is one of them, a uh, very large insurance company that they've told me, I could say, has a red logo and they're based in Bloomington, Illinois, but they said not to use our logo. Uh, and then uh, a third one, which is probably one of the biggest, largest, uh, big box uh, grocery and department stores that, that you find in the world. So there, there are a whole bunch of applications for this. But what, what our strategy is, a lot of companies found us through failover. They fell in love with us through our cloud-based management, which we haven't talked about before, but we'll, we'll go through a little bit about that. Um, and that's a very unique um, tool that we have in our arsenal going after these enterprise customers. And then for us, it's land and expand. We have a lot of these companies that, uh, you know, some of the companies who are innovating here have, uh, you know, six, seven applications already. But, but that's the idea. And it, and it spans a variety of enterprises, retail, finance, insurance, vehicles, et cetera, government. Um, one little factoid is the um, uh, NORAD in Colorado Springs runs the Santa Claus tracker. And the general down there said, get that off of my military network. <laughs> so they created a separate parallel network and they have two cradle point routers in there and that's how they run the, uh, the Santa tracking for Norad. I thought you were gonna say Santa Claus has a cradle point device on his sled. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited for a second. He has not allowed us to talk about that, but he did say- He has a red logo he and he's, he's from a, the North Pole. A, a fat guy that rides a sleigh <laughs> magically in the air. So here's how, uh, and this is kind of a slide that's going to walk through the use cases, but this is how we're seeing enterprises use it. We're seeing them on the, on the fixed 4G network, a variety of applications uh, adding backup to the MPLS, backup to cable, uh, day one internet. If you've ever tried to get wired access, sometimes they'll come back and say, yeah, it'll be six to eight weeks. We can get them going on day one. And then when they're ready to uh, get the wired hooked up, then that we can be the failover role. Locations uh, without wired access uh, where you really don't have an option. Hurricane Sandy created an environment where there were a bunch of retail stores that did not have wires. And so Verizon came to us and bought about 2,000 of our routers and passed it around to their enterprise customers. And that's what they've been using during the rebuild. There was a central office that had four feet of water. And then you read through the article and they said, this was the ground floor, but the central office was in the four floor basement floors. It destroyed it. They had, it was a two-year rebuild, so they're still using our, our, our um, routers there. Temporary locations, store within a store. Uh, we'll talk about these. On the mobile network side, fire, uh, fire trucks, police, buses, taxis. M to M, this is where you get kiosks, digital signage, uh, ATMs, HVAC control, which is heating, ventilation, air conditioning, etc. And then we'll talk about the failover. So... Getting into a little bit of details on the platform, uh, um, this will be the overview slide and then I'll drill down a little bit. Essentially what we've created, what the, the hardware that I have on the table here is the tip of the iceberg. That's the stuff that's easy for me to bring down in a suitcase. Uh, what's hard to show is the investment that we've made into cloud-based management and applications. And I'll talk a little bit about that on a different slide. But we have what we call Enterprise Cloud Manager, which are our second generation uh, platform that we launched about two and a half years ago. Uh, we took everything that we learned in launching the first one and really did it right. Service-oriented architecture, uh, you know, RESTful APIs, virtualized hosted at AWS for scalability. And we use that um, 
And I'll, I'll talk about how we use that on the next slide. And then essentially very close relationships with the carriers. Uh, this is just something that we've been very good at over the last seven years. So if I drill down into the architecture, what you see are the four categories of hardware platforms on the bottom. And this is a leveraged platform. So all of the firmware that we develop is used across those platforms. We have our enterprise cloud manager, which is the heart of our uh, you know, again, management application platform. We have efforts that we're doing on the extensibility side, infrastructure side, but the five big areas for us are management services, networking services, security services, IoT, Internet of Things um, services, and then business intelligence and analytics. And our priority has been, as a company, is left to right. So I would say we're uh, the platform is more mature on the management services, the networking side, et cetera, and we're starting to build out the right side. But for example, on the networking services, we support multiple WANs. We could have wires coming in there. Uh, we have dual modem products where we could have AT&T and Verizon, as well as SIM cards for Sprint and T-Mobile on standby. Uh, we support Metro Wi-Fi, carrier Wi-Fi. So we're, start, we're in a position where we can treat the various wireless and wired WANs as almost a, a virtual WAN that is elastic and scalable. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that um, a little bit later as well. On the security side, uh, we, we have integrated best of breed. We recognize that customers want to see names they trust. And so we've integrated Trend Micro for the IPS IDS. Uh, we've done some really good integration, which we'll show you with Zscaler. Um, and, uh, and then using location, since we're, uh, we have modems in there uh, with carriers, we have GPS location. And we can integrate that into our security story and start to use location as an authentication factor. If a cradle point router is being operated more than a mile away from the nearest Redbox kiosk, Redbox might want to know that. <laughs> So without uh, further ado, I, I would like to bring David Rush up here, and uh, he's going to give us a, uh, a little juggling vignette. And again, I want to introduce, David is a real product manager. We did not hire him because he was a juggler. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But he's uh, actually, we have a Cradle Point uh, block party on Friday, and we'll talk about it. But David is, a, is going to be attempting to set a... Uh, Guinness Book of World's Record for blindfolded juggling. But I've asked him to start slowly, so this is his start. All right, well, thank you, Ken. Uh, my name is David. I am going to do a little juggling, try to tell a little brief history of Cradle Point, a little story, keep it a little more engaging, uh, tell, tell, tell the story through analogy, and I'll show you what I really learned while I was at MIT versus uh, I called this my stress relief while I was there. So we've got Cradle Point. And when I first arrived, when I, when I took this PHS 300 and I plugged a USB stick in it five and a half years ago, I'm like, I've got the internet in my hands. I was blown away. And this was like after I'd been at, at, at MIT for a while and, uh, and I came back. So. Uh, we, we start with plugging a USB modem into a router. You know, this is the really basic. You got a, a personal hotspot. You know, this is pretty easy. We can, in fact, we can do this with our eyes closed now, like this. All right, and they're like, well, now can you create a VPN tunnel to make it a little security? I know that's, that's not too hard. We'll add a little, little uh, this is called the tennis pattern here. And then it's like, well, can you um, make it work reliably enough that I can stick it in a kiosk, set up all of my network topology so it's secure, and then drive away and not have to worry about a truck full for the next six months? And we figured out how to do that. And it can be complex underneath, but simple and beautiful as well. Mills mess. It's also repeatable. So you can have a depl multiple deployments, and, uh, and now you're going somewhere with the wheel, and the wheel back the other direction. Hey, you, you can clap. It's all right. <laughs> not going to eject there. Keep a little more lighthearted and engaged. And then it's, uh, how, do you, how do you take that? What if, what if you want to be more complex? We, we decided six years ago we wanted to be an enterprise company versus a consumer-based company. We need things like, hey, what if I want OSPF, BGP RIP, STP, VRP, um, Multiple VLANs, multiple uh, VPN endpoint termination with split tunneling, uh, partial private networks along with uh, MPLS network support, and I want to be able to cloud manage this all from the cloud uh, with one small IT team across 30,000 routers across the country. Well, we can do that too now as an enterprise-based company, but it's going to take you some help. We've got a great enterprise support team and uh, senior solutions engineers like Michael Dickens over there to come along and, uh, and hold your hand to help you uh, simplify the process just a little bit here. <laughs> Hold on with one hand. And then once we get you know, set up like that, it runs like a machine. 
<laughs> Sometimes it takes a life of its own. <laughs> In fact, we can make it do whatever you want. <laughs> All right. Very brief history of Creative Point, and we'll be back for some more in a little bit.